Before the break, I want to finish up uh, the, the topic that I call stream algorithms. Uh, and uh, thinking about it, I realized I wasn't being too careful, um, except for, the, the, well, there are four different algorithms I'm going to talk about, and except for the last one, computing moments. Uh, th these are algorithms that were all invented before anybody had talked about streams. And yet I somehow think of them as stream algorithms. And I think the reason is that um, while they were designed to deal with arbitrary sets, um, if you really have sets, that is, all your data is available anytime you want it, rather than just flowing in uh, as somebody else uh, wants to deliver it, uh, there are always better ways to do things. Uh, in particular, these days, you can do a lot, a lot in parallel. Okay. So, um, so I, I want to think of these as stream-related uh, stream algorithms, although I think you, you'll, you'll see quite obviously that, that it could just as well apply uh, if you had uh, a, a large set. Uh, okay, so the first... Uh, the first of the topics is, is, is the idea of the Bloom filter. Many people, I think, have probably heard of Bloom filters, but let, let me just uh, introduce the idea uh, b b briefly. Um, now, to motivate this, l let's imagine I have a web crawl. now, what, crawler. Now, what's a web crawler? It's uh, a large number of processes probably running on a large number of machines, uh, and each one is visiting a page finding the links on that page, reporting the links back to a central server. Uh, and uh, you, you, want, you want to make sure that every URL you find eventually gets crawled. Well, not everyone. If you do that, the, the, the whole process never ends. But, uh, but you at least want to have the option of crawling any page that you find. OK. Uh, so, but you don't want to crawl the same page over and over again. So you'd like to know when a, one, of, one of the crawling processes finds a URL, have I seen it before? Okay. Um, well, you know, I, again, I, you know, I could do, if I, did, if I had a list of all the pages that I've ever seen, then I could just, look it up in, in some kind of an index. But that's, that's really expensive. So what you'd want, what you, you know, because there, there, you know, there are trillions of pages that, that are being crawled. Um, so so what, what you want is a, um, a, something that takes less space and gives you an approx approximate answer to the question, have I seen this URL before? So. Uh, the, uh, the, the way you would use a Bloom filter is uh, every time one of the crawling processes reports back a new URL, you want to, you're going to hash that in some way, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, how that's done, and decide either I've seen it before or I haven't. Okay. Um, now, if... If a URL is declared new by this filter, then you will eventually crawl it, or decide not to, because at some point you have you have to say I've crawled enough. This is this is going to be my web index, and anything that's so far out from, uh, so hard to find on on the web, I'm not going to report. I mean, anyway, but but basically, uh, you, you know, you you sort of want to to look at any page that you think is new. Uh, now. The, the, Bloom, the problem with the Bloom filter, again, what, what you give up in order to save the space, is that you sometimes get false positives. Now, in this particular application, things are really not working the right way um, because you might say that a URL has been seen before when it really hasn't. If you do that, then you're never going to crawl it. Okay. Well, um, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but 
what you can do is every once in a while you change your bloom filter. Okay, so now if there's only one link to this page, there's no, uh, you need, it probably has such a low page rank, it's never going to be shown anyway. So you, you don't worry about it. Uh, if there are lots of ways to find it and you occasionally uh, institute a new uh, bloom filter, uh, you'll eventually, it'll not be a false positive and, and you'll go look at it. So, so this is, um, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the example because it's not exactly a perfect example, but uh, uh, it should give you, at least, you know, put things in perspective. So the bloom filter, when it says you've seen something, when it says you haven't seen something, you really haven't seen it. If it says you have seen it, you might not have, have seen it. Uh, and of course, by tuning the filter that it's using more space, uh, you can make it less and less likely that, that you get a, a false, uh, a false uh, positive. Um, OK. Um, OK, so the Bloom filter, you just think of it as a very long array of bits. And you have one or more hash functions. Uh, the hash function will take an element in, in the, the stream, let's say, like a URL. And it returns a position in the array, uh, presumably uh, equally likely to return any, any position. Uh, now, you start off, with the Bloom filter is all zeros. And when in, an input arrives, say x, we hash x. And uh, let's say if h is one of the hash functions, we set the bit h of x to 1. Now, it may already have been 1. That's OK. But it will surely be 1 after x arrives. And we do that for every hash function. So uh, let me give you just a little example. In this case, the um, length of this filter is 11 bits. That's, of course, ridiculously tiny. Think of it as a billion <laughs> bits might be a more appropriate uh, number. Uh, we'll assume we have integers. I'm going to have two hash functions. The first one is this. Um, you look at the odd position bits from the right end, so, low, so the low order bit uh, since the integer is, is represented in binary, you're taking the, um, the one's place, the four's place, the 16's place, and so on, uh, dropping out the other bits, and that gives you some bit sequence which you can then interpret as an, in, as an integer. Uh, and uh, as an integer i, you take i modulo 11, and that's the bit of the array that you want to set to 1. And the second hash function is exactly the same, except it takes the other bits, the even position bits. So, um, OK, so initially, okay, this is the initial condition. The filter is 11 zeros. Now, the number 21, uh, 25 comes in. Now, if you look at it, what I've tried to do is the, the even position bits are in red and the odd position, position bits are in, uh, in black. So if you focus on just, say, the black, that's what H1 gives you. That's 1, 0, 1. Uh, that's 5. 5 modulo 11 is still 5. Uh, now, for H2, you look only at the red, and that's 1, 0. That's 2. And again, 2 modulo 11 is uh, two, and therefore you set uh, bits two and five. I'm counting the bit zero, of course, is the is is the left end. Uh, so I've set those two bits to uh, to ones. Okay, and the blue bits are the ones that I just set. Now the next uh, min, uh, stream element 159. Again, the black is zero one one one. That's seven. And um, the, uh, the even positions are 1, 0, 1, 1, which is 11. And 11 modulo 11 is 0. So I set bits uh, 0 and 7 to 1. So now you can see that four bits are set to 1. Uh, 
uh, here's the next uh, stream element. Uh, again, we do the arithmetic. The black gives you nine. The um, uh, the red. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, the black. The black gives you nine. The red is one zero zero one zero, which is eighteen. Eighteen modulo eleven is seven. So bits nine and seven get set. Well, seven was already set to one, so you don't set it again. Uh, or you can, it doesn't matter. And now bit 9 is set. So 5 of the 11 bits wind up being set. OK? Now, um, again, the filter is an approximation to, uh, to the question, have I seen this element before? OK, so um, uh, again, a, a new element comes in. I want to know, or well, it's presented to you in some, some manner. I want to know if I've seen it before. So I compute all the hash functions applied to this new element, element y. And, um, okay, if all the positions, in all, uh, the results of all the hash functions are positions that have a 1, then I'm going to say that I've seen y before. Notice, we could be wrong. Certainly, if I have seen y, all those bits will be set to 1. But it's also possible that they got set, each one got set because of some other input that happened to hash to, to that position. Uh, so um, again, we could have false positives. We say that we've seen it, but we haven't. Uh, but on the other hand, if any one of the positions is 0, then we surely haven't seen y. Because if we had seen y, we would have set that to 1. Okay. So here's a, um, uh, again, th th this was the, the, the Bloom filter as I left it after uh, the, those three, three inputs came in. Uh, and now I want to know, is 118 a member of the, uh, of the set? Obviously, it wasn't. If, if you remember, 118 was not one of the elements that, that, that came in. Um, so I, I, again, I break 118 binary is that. So it's 1110 uh, is H, H1. So that's 14 modulo uh, 11 gives you 3. So H1 of Y is th 3. And H2 of Y, uh, that's the red, is just 5. Now it turns out bit five, which is of course the sixth position in in uh, it's uh, yeah, zero one two three four five. Uh, the fifth position is one, so it looks like maybe we did see one eighteen, but fortunately, position three zero one two three is a zero. So I, I'm absolutely certain that I have not seen uh, one one eighteen. Okay, now, uh, you know, you want to you want to know certain things. Um, well, I mean, in particular, you want to know what's the what's the false positive rate. Okay. Um, well, the the only way you can get again you can get a false positive is if by at random you have set all the bits that are the targets of, all, of each of the hash functions, uh, you've set them to 1. So, so I'm saying the probability that a given element is a false positive is the fraction of the array that's 1's raised to the power of the number of hash functions. Because we assume the hash functions are independent, so you've got that number of independent events, each of which occurs with uh, with the probability that is the fraction of the, of the ones. Um, okay. Um, now the number of ones will be roughly okay, the number of elements you've inserted times the number of hash functions you're using, but it's going to be a little bit less than that. Why? Because there'll be some collisions. Sometimes you'll be setting a bit to one that already was one. Uh, 
and, and we, can, we can actually do the math. Uh, I, I want to do the math because it, it comes up in a number of, of guises, and I don't want to have to do it all, um, uh, do it each time. I'm just going to sort of throw it out from, from, here, from here on. But, uh, okay, you th what you think, of, think of it as you, you have the darts. D is the number of, uh, of elements times the number of hash functions. And you've got t targets. T is the length of the array. Uh, every dart gets thrown, uh, hits one of the targets. Again, it's all random equal probability. And what I want to know is, uh, what's the expected number of targets that are hit by one or more darts? Okay. Uh, so let's see. Okay, the probability, if I throw one dart, the probability that any given target is hit is 1 over t, the number of different targets. Now, um, well, okay, I claim the probability that I throw d darts and a particular target is not hit is this. It's 1 minus 1 over t. Well, that's the probability that one dart doesn't hit it. And again, because the darts are independent events, uh, I raise that to the number of darts that I throw, and that gives me the probability that a, ta a target is not hit, or put it another way, that it's zero in the spit array stays zero. Uh, now, I want to write this as, well, as I've done here. All I've done is I've replaced d by t times d divided by t. That's still d, obviously. But Notice what I have, which is um, 1 minus 1 over t to the tth power. So that's like 1 minus epsilon to the 1 over epsilon. And as epsilon goes to 0, what is that? 1 over e. Um, okay, well, uh, okay, so, uh, again, so, so the, all right, if I take out every, everything but the d over t, that's 1 over e, or e to the minus 1, and then I've got that raised to the d over t power, so you get e to the d over, t, the minus d over t, is the, is the probability that a, uh, a, a, you know, an element of the array stays zero. Okay. So, uh, let's say, do the math. Uh, okay, suppose I'm going to have an array of my size is a billion, and I'm going to use five hash functions, and I'm going to insert a hundred million elements. Okay, so how many darts do I have? Well, half a billion darts. A billion targets. So what is the probability that a target is never hit? Um, well, that probability is e to the minus a half, and, and if, you, if you look it up in a table or something, it's, it's this. It's, it's almost, it's about 61%. So 31, 31, sorry, 39% of the targets do get hit, 61% uh, do not get hit. Okay, that's, that's sort of, you know, it should be like 50% hit, 50% not hit, but again, because some targets are going to have two darts or three darts sticking out of them, uh, the actual number of, tar of targets that remain clean will be a little over half. Okay, so anyway, the density of ones is the complement of that, that's, that's uh, 0.393. And therefore, the probability of a false par a positive, remember, we have five hash functions. So it's 0.393 to the fifth power, and it's a little bit under 1%. Okay. So if I want to look up an element, 1% of the time when, it's, when it is uh, not present, I will say falsely that it, that it is. But that's all it is, just 1%. Okay, uh, let's see, moving, moving right along here. So, okay, I want to talk about uh, sampling a stream. The, uh, the idea is some, sometimes 
uh, you, you, you can't afford to process an entire stream, but you'd like to answer a, a question by looking at only a sample of, of it. Uh, this is a very common problem. Again, and it's also a, a, a problem in databases. Um, you know, you have some humongous set and, you know, you could process the whole thing, but if you take a random sample, very often you can get the right answer. But what I want to, to, to show you is you got to do it right. Okay. Uh, so uh, so here, here's an example of, of, a, of a stream type of, of, of problem. Um, and so Google, Google wants to look at all the search queries that have been asked for the past month and find out how many of these have, have only been asked once. That is, they appear in the stream, but they don't, but they don't appear. Uh, uh, but they only, but they only, they only appear once. Now, again, you could process the whole stream, uh, because this, you know, the obvious algorithm is going to require you to then record everything you've ever seen, and uh, and sort of count how many times it appears, or at least count it's appeared once, it's appeared more than once, you know, once it's appeared more than once, you don't care about it, but you can't forget about it because if it then appears again, you don't want to think that that's the first time it appeared. So um, it's a little messy. So, uh, so let's say, well, let's, let's say we'll, we'll sample a tenth of the stream and then we'll just multiply the answer by 10. Okay. Does that work? No. Okay. Um, the trouble is that the fraction of queries that are, are unique in the sample is not going to be the same as the fraction in, uh, that appear in the whole stream. So you can't just multiply it by 10. And in fact, it, it turns out that there's no number you can multiply by to adjust the answer in the sample to give you the, the, the true or an approximation to the true answer in the entire set. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just a completely wrong way to do things. But I, I, I want to just explain, I think, one more slide to explain why. Uh, uh, so, okay, obviously, okay, we're taking at random a sample of 10% of, of the stream. If the query is unique, then it has a 10% chance of being in that sample and will surely be unique in that sample. So it will be identified. But suppose the query occurs twice in the stream. Well, I claim it has an 18% chance of appearing exactly once in the sample. Okay, because you've got first occurrence, second occurrence. Chance of the first occurrence appears is 10%. And if it does appear, the chances are 90% that the other one will not appear and therefore will make the first occurrence look, uh, look unique. So that's 9% of the time. And then the same way, 90% of the time, the first occurrence won't appear, but the second one will 10% of the time. So that's another 9%. That's why I get 18%. Uh, and the, if, if it appears three times, there's a 27% chance it'll be unique or something. Uh, at any, any rate, the, the point is, since you don't know the distribution of a number of occurrences, you don't know how many unique things you're going to falsely see in, in the stream. And uh, you know, the bottom line is this, is this is just not the way to do it. Okay. So then the interesting thing is, is there a way to do this? Can I actually sample 10% of the stream and get a number which will be the, uh, the, 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 so the fraction of stream elements so the fraction of, of, of sample elements that are unique will tell me the fraction of elements that are unique in the entire set. Is, is it even possible? How many think yes? Yeah, I, I mean, I w obviously wouldn't be doing this if the answer were yes. Uh, yeah, um, but, but you've got to do it right. Okay, and... The, the answer is that, okay, what was going wrong was we were sampling based on the position of the strip. So we're just, 
you know, looking at the stream and taking this position, that position, that position, and so on, at, at random. What you want to do is sample values. But you don't know what values are. You don't know what all the search queries are going to be in a month. So, so, um, so this is another application of hashing. Okay. So, for example, suppose I take a search query, just hash it to 10 buckets. Okay, again, so at, at random, the probability uh, you know, of, of being in any bucket is 10%. And my sample will be all those search queries that happen to, uh, to, to, to go to bucket zero. Now, the, the nice thing about this is, if you look at a search query, porn, let's say, it will either be in bucket zero or it won't. If it's in bucket zero, all of its occurrences are in the sample. So if it's unique in the sample, it will be unique in the full set. Okay. If it's not in bucket zero, none of its occurrences will be in bucket zero. You'll never even see it in the sample. Okay. And therefore, the fraction of unique occurrences in the sample should be a good estimator of the number uh, in, in the entire set. Fraction, it should be the same. Um, the same fraction. Um, well, just just sort of do some icing on the cake here. Um, you know that's fine as long as uh, you know I say well I, I want a ten percent sample. You know if I wanted a five percent sample, I'd hash the twenty buckets. Um, Okay, but what if I don't know how, how long my stream is going to be? And I don't know how many search queries are going to be asked in a month. Um, I, but I want my sample size, let's say, to be no more than a billion search queries, no matter whether that's a 10% sample or a 2% sample or, or, or what. Um, well, you don't have to hash to only the, you know, uh, if you want a one, one in K sample, uh, you don't have to hash to just K buckets. You can hash to many buckets. And, um, you know, as, as well, uh, let, let, I think the example should make it clear. So uh, we'd like a 10% sample, but, we also can't, as, as the stream go, comes in, it, if that sample gets too large, we might want a smaller sample. Okay. Uh, then let's say I hash to 100 buckets. Well, again, I want a 10% sample, so I'll, I'll take buckets 0 through 9. Or I could pick any 10 buckets I liked, but let, let's just say 0 through 9 uh, to be concrete. Now, suppose uh, you know, the, the sample is, is, is too big at some point. So now I say, oh, gee, I really shouldn't have taken all 10, bu 10 of those buckets. Uh, let me get rid of one of the buckets, say bucket 9. Well, I can do that because I, I can rehash everything in my sample, or I can keep the hash value uh, along with every sample uh, element that, that I've taken. And I simply throw out of the sample everything that hashes the bucket nine. And I, I maintain this, this idea that I'm only keeping an element in my sample if I keep all elements in my sample, of, of the, the, all identical occurrences of that, of that element in the, in the sample. Uh, you know, well, anyway, you know, if I need to get rid of another bucket, I can say get rid of eight, and, and, and I keep going. Uh, now. Uh, there's there's uh, again, there's a there's a story here, which is um, this is actually it's a very simple example of a situation where you see data as key value pairs, and you want to sample on the key only. Okay, in uh, in in this in the simple example I gave you. The key was the whole thing. There was no associated value. The key was just the search query. And that's, that's all we wanted to do. But you can, uh, I'll, I'll give you a more complicated example in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, but the, the point is, you can hash the keys to buckets. You 
choose as your sample, you uh, you you pick the um, those keys that hash to the chosen bucket or the, the one of the chosen buckets. Uh, and what this gives you is a sample in which either all or none of the, of the elements that have a particular key value will appear in the sample. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, let's, let me just give you a, a more complicated example. Uh, I, I, think, I think this should be enough to make it clear. OK, so um, my data, again, you can think of it as a set or a stream. It doesn't matter. Uh, they're, but they're tuples that have an employee ID or, num or name, uh, the department to which they belong, and their salary. And the query I, I want is, I want to know what is the average range of salaries within a department. That is, for to find a for each department, there's a someone getting the lowest salary in that department, there's somebody getting the highest salary. Take the the uh, the highest minus the lowest. That's the range for that department, and I'd like to average that out over all departments. But. Again, I want to take a sample. I, I don't want to look at, you know, maybe there are a million departments. I don't know what kind of a crazy organization this is. But, uh, I don't want to look at all million uh, departments. I just want to take a sample of the departments. And, but I want to do it um, sort of fairly. So I'm going to let the key be the department. And the value is, all, is the, the other fields, the employee and, and the, the salary. Um, See, if, if, I, if I pick tuples at random, then let's say for the toy department, I'd get some of the employees and not others. And so if I computed the minimum and maximum salaries, what I would get is the minimum and maximum salaries for those employees in the toy department that happen to be in the sample. That would be a narrower range than the true range for the toy department. So I'd be biasing. Uh, the uh, the ranges for the departments in a uh, in some mysterious way. I I know it's too small, but I don't know. I, there's no way for me to compute the correct value. Again, that's if I sample by position rather than by key. Okay, but okay. But the key is if the key is the department, then I'm really just sampling d uh, departments, and I you know, uh, well, okay, that, that's that's really all there is to it, right? Uh, uh, you know, what I get is for each department in my sample, I see all the employees in that department, and therefore can compute the exact range of salaries, and I can compute the average among all the departments that I've taken. And since I took the departments at random, there's a reasonable chance that that. That, that the average in the sample is pretty close to the, the true average. Okay, there's no, at any rate, there's no bias. Jeff, yes? So, I mean, even in your previous example, it's, so it's clear that if you take a look at only the one bucket, one hash, you will find uh, all the uh, sort of unique queries there. But uh, my question is about the remaining ones, because you would infer the ratio Say how many unique queries are based yeah. on the how, how many remaining? Yeah, yeah right. right. Uh, well, if I want to, yeah, okay. The fraction of unique queries should be the same in the sample and the set size, or the entire set should have ten times, in this case, as many. Right. But yeah. then, what, what I do, I'm not sure I understand is if we assume that the, say that the keys or the, the, the hashes uh, of, the, of the arriving data or the queries might be say, have a power law distribution, you might end up in a bucket which has a very popular key, and then you'll be over or underestimating the, the actual ratio. I mean, is it that... Well, there's no power law. I mean, a hash function is, must be designed so that the, the, well, there's a power, the power is zero power. It's equally likely to put, uh, a, in that case, a, a search query in, in any of the 10 buckets. Yes, yes. But then, say, 
There is a, a unique query about, say, um, yeah. Bergendahl Hotel. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a query for weather, mm -hmm. which was, you know, 100,000 uh, times. Yeah, over. well... And then you would think it's uh, 1 over 100,000, or while it, maybe this was a very... No, 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 because if, if, if the bucket only has two queries, weather and Berg, Bergendahl, you know, and Bergendahl is unique, and weather appears two or more times. You don't care whether how many more times it appears. You're going to say half the queries in this bucket are unique, and therefore I have no reason to believe other than that all half of all queries are unique. Okay, so you don't take into account the volume. No, no, you're counting. You're counting the fraction of queries that. Uh, in the sample that are unique, just as you do in the full set, right? That, that is, that is I'm, I'm asking, uh, okay, actually, I, you know, it actually doesn't matter. I mean, I always, I assume that I was asking, among all the queries in the full set, how many of those queries appear at most, uh, appear only once? I could just as well ask, you know, waiting, uh, w waiting queries by the number of occurrences, what is the weight of the queries that appear only once? I'd get a much smaller number, but if that's the query I want to ask, the, the, the sample still should be, well, the expected value will be the same uh, because there will be, uh, there'll be a few you know, queries like weather or porn is actually more common, but... Uh, Again, you'll, uh, you know, if, you, if, if a few really common queries happen to be in your sample, you get more variance. You, you, increase, you know, it, uh, the, the, well, the variance, the variance goes up, so, so that's a, hard, a little harder query to, to get the true result on. But it's, but it's a sa the same principle. I mean, it, it you know... It, it, No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, no, the expected value is true whether, whether you're weighting queries by number of occurrences or not. But if you, but, but the, the variance is higher if you weight by number of occurrences because it does introduce more noise. But if that's the question you want to know, you got to ask it that way. And, okay. Uh, okay, let's see, I am... Uh, let, let's see. Well, let's see how far we can go. Um, okay, Th this is this is a, a again a, a, another story. Uh, it's, again, it's an old old algorithm. I think it dates from around 1983, four, something, something like that. Um, and it's um, the problem is is counting the number of distinct elements. Uh, again, think of it as a stream. Uh, Uh, okay, elements come in, sometimes they repeat. Again, you can think of it as search queries if you want. You know, you know uh, this is sort of the dual of the problem that we, we were just talking about. How many search, you know, how many different search queries are asked in a month? Okay. Um, well, you can solve the problem. All you have to do is keep a list of all the queries you've seen so far. And a new query comes in, you just look it up on in the, you know, some sort of a hash index or something, so you can do this fairly efficiently. Uh, you can um, see whether you've seen it or not. If you have seen it, you can ignore it. If you have never seen it, you have to add it to the, to the set of, of things that you've seen. Okay. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a few examples of how this, is, this can be used, um, suppose I'm, I'm crawling, again, crawling the web. Uh, I might, when I, when I reach a site, uh, I, I, I might want to know whether or not this is a, a site that has been set up uh, as, as some sort of a fake. And, and we're going to talk, um, I guess, tomorrow about combating li link spam and how link spammers will set up sites of fake pages. Uh, 
Well, um, you know, and what's an easy way to set up a site with a million fake pages? Um, just take some page from somewhere and duplicate it a million times. If you do that, the number of different words on that site is going to be really small, right? Because every word that appears will appear at least a million times. Um, you know, or another way to do it is to just sort of produce random words and, and fill up your pages with, with, with random words. Uh, if you do that, you're going to get a lot uh, more word, different words in that site than you would normally expect. Um, and so as we're crawling a site, we might want to count the number of distinct words just to, to see is this a spam site or not. Um, well, very common query, Facebook wants to report how many unique users visited. Okay, so think of the stream is every time you log on to Facebook, that's an element of the stream. If you log on 100 times in a month, they only, they're only supposed to count you once. Okay, um, but you think, you know, there are a billion users who might log on in a month, and so they've got to keep a set of a billion people that they've seen. Okay, uh, and, you know, not that you can't do it, but it's, it, but it's a pain in the neck. Um, another application which I've seen is, um, again, when you, again, this has to do with web crawling again. Again, you can't crawl everywhere. So what you'd like to do if you come to a page is you'd like to decide, do I want to follow its links? Well, the answer is, if its page rank is going to be high, then yeah, you'd like to follow it. But if the page rank is low, it's probably not going to be the answer to anybody's search query anyway, so we'll just forget about it. Trouble is, you can't compute page rank until you crawl the web. You're just crawling the web now, so you don't know what the page rank is. But on the other hand, what you can do at least is uh, compute the number of links to each page that you've seen. So if, if, if the number of links into a page is high, that's a good reason to suspect that the page rank will be high. It's not, not a guarantee, but it's, but it's, it's reasonable. OK. So suppose we don't really want to, for any of a number of reasons, including space, we don't want to actually store how many elements are we uh, uh, we don't want to store the complete list of elements that we've seen so far. Um, so what you, what you want to do, in, well, the, the reason, the next, the next best thing is we're going to estimate the count, and we want to do it in an unbiased way. So we'll say, okay, it could be a, an error up or down, but we'd like to know at least that the more effort we apply to estimating this count, the, the, the closer to uh, correct we, we will probably uh, come. OK, so, and remember, n, little n is the, is the number of elements that might exist. That's sort of the universal set of elements. OK, now I want to just take a, I'm going to take a hash function that maps elements to, uh, well, at least log n bits. Uh, it could be more. And for each element, I want to compute what, what, what I think of as the tail of the hash value. Okay, so uh, we're going to let r of a is the number of zeros at the end of the bit string h of a. Okay. So again, assuming that h is going to give you a random bit string, half of them r of a is 0. Another quarter r of a is 1. A, a, an eighth r of a will be 2 and so on. And now I'm going to record the maximum r that I've actually seen. And my estimate based on this hash function will be 2 to the r. Okay, and, and sort of in, intuitively, you know, if, if I see 2 to the r things, 2 to the cap, capital R things, then it's probable that one of those 
things will have a tail as long as the logarithm of the number of things I've seen. That's capital R. Okay. Well, okay, it, it's not actually that simple. But let, let me first tell you why it works, then I'll tell you why it doesn't actually work. Okay. Uh, I mean, what, what is true is, is that, that you're, you, you're going to be, ba the, the value of capital R, or of so two to the capital R, will be approximate, will be always near the number of elements, of distinct elements that, that, that you've seen. Uh, okay, so, okay, the, Okay, look, look at it this way. The, okay, what it says here, here look at the probability that some random bit string, H of A, ends in at least I zeros is 2 to the minus I. Okay, that is it's certain, the probability is 1 that it ends in at least no zeros. The probability is a half that it ends in at least 1 zero, at least it's a quarter that it ends in at least 2 zeros and so on. Now suppose that the true number is and the true number of different elements is m. Okay. Um, now again, that means I'm hashing m different elements. So what is the probability that R is at least i? Well. Uh, Okay, I, I, I claim it's this, this formula. One, well, you, you can read the formula. But 1 minus 2 to the minus i is the probability that a given h of a doesn't have a tail of, of i or more zeros. Okay. And then if you raise that to the nth power, and this is sort of like throwing darts at targets again, uh, the probability that all of the m different uh, hash values have fewer than i zeros is, uh, is that raised to the nth power and well okay and, and therefore the probability that r is at least i that is at least one of the m elements has a tail as long as i will be 1 minus that okay uh, so, so here's again, so here's our formula the probability um, Again, 1 minus, 1 minus 2 to the minus i, all raised to the m. That's the probability that cap r uh, is, at least, uh, is at least i. I'm sorry, the 2, the two to the r is at least, is at least i. Uh, okay, now, I say 2 to the minus i is small. Assuming i is, you know, is, is even a, f a small, you know, it's 3 or 4. Uh, 2 to the minus i is al already kind of small. Uh, and I'm not going to go into this, but this is, again, sort of, an, it's, you know, as with the dar darts and targets, you can, can, you can write this as an, an exp uh, exponent of, of e, and it turns out to be 1 minus e to the minus m times 2 to the minus i. Uh, now, suppose 2 to the i is much bigger than m. That says... Um, R just was freakishly large, much larger than you would expect. Okay. Um, well, if 2 to the i is much bigger than m, then uh, m times 2 to the minus i is e to the, uh, well, it's e to a tiny fraction. And if it's a tiny fraction, I can replace e to the tiny fraction by the first two terms of the Taylor expansion. And so I get, uh, well, I, I, you can see what I've got there. And then the, one, the, the ones cancel. And what I have is m divided by 2 to the i. And then I just told you that 2 to the i is, is much bigger than m, so this is approximately 0. So that says the chances that you're going to get a way too big r is very small. On the other hand, if... 2 to the i is much less than m, that is, are you going to get a, 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 a if i is, is much smaller than you'd expect, uh, then uh, e to the minus m times 2 to the minus i, that's e to a large number, 
and that's essentially zero, so it's one minus zero is approximately one. So uh, th this sort of says you get, you always get close. Okay, that is, that is the estimate will always be around M. Okay, uh, but here's, here, here's sort of why it doesn't work. Okay, and, and the, the, the intuition is, yeah, you're always around, two to the R is always around M, but when it's much bigger, when R is, mu is bigger than it should be, the value goes up exponentially. When it's much smaller, the values just decay a little bit. So there's this bias to the upside. Okay. Um, that is, if you replace R by R plus 1, uh, then it is true the probability that, that R is that big it goes down by a factor of 2, but the value doubles. So when you sum all the possible values of capital R, uh, you get an, an infinite sum. Uh, so what we want to do, what we really want to do is have a break, which we will in a second. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, what you're going to do, first of all, you're not going to just, I've been talking all along as if you only did one hash function. You actually have to do many hash functions, say a hundred different hash functions, and then you combine. Each hash function will give you a, an estimate of uh, an estimate of the number of distinct elements, which will be two to its r, its its capital R, um, and then you have to combine them. Well, a average is no good because again, the, because it's the infinite expected value. If if I have one of those hundred values is just outsized large, uh, it, it, will, it will bias the, the, the whole average. Uh, you could take medians, but since every estimate is a power of two, what that says is you could only get powers of two as estimates. Uh, again, you'll be, tend to be a very close to, the median will tend to be very close to the true value, but it could be off by a factor of, 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 of two almost. Uh, so what you do is you, you take your samples, you partition, them in, you partition them into small groups of roughly log n in, in each group. Uh, you take the average within groups. Okay, so again, if a group happens to have an outsized large element, it will just give you a, a way too large average. But that's okay, because then you're going to take the median of the averages. And the chances of a lot of groups having very, very uh, annoyingly large elements is, is small enough that it won't affect the median. Okay, so you, you take the median of the averages and you're okay. Okay, and um, now I think this is probably a, a good time to take a break. And uh, we will continue. I get the feeling I will probably not be able to get through slide set five today, but that's okay because seven and eight are kind of small, so we'll, we'll, we'll catch up tomorrow.